Julian Langness, hello. This is uh, Piero San Giorgio. Hi, Piero. It's uh, great to, to speak to you. I've, um, I've heard about you from this, the excellent uh, Red Ice uh, radio uh, uh, podcast. And um, it's great if you can tell us about what you do, because uh, I think our, our listeners will find it uh, as exciting as I do. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So you're um, an author, a blogger, and uh, I'm sure many other things. Can, can you tell us a little bit about, about who you are and what you do? Definitely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a writer. I write for CounterCurrents. Uh, I've written a number of articles for traditional right. Uh, I also have a, a website that I, that I run and, and write for called EuropeanCivilWar.com that attempts to track and analyze what's going on with the, the very fluid situation in Europe, which you're obviously very familiar with. And then I'm also the author of a book, that just came out in January as an ebook, and which will be coming out in a physical form later this month, and that is uh, titled Fist Fights with Muslims in Europe, One Man's Journey Through Modernity, and that basically details the uh, trips I, time I spent in Europe as a teenager and in my mid-20s uh, as an American, and uh, the experiences I had over there, and, and how those informed me both personally and, and politically. In uh, in fact, what uh, what struck me with the, is the title of your book. In in the sense that um, um, fist fights uh, are, are are have always been common with young men, and uh, the title of your book mentions Muslims in Europe. And um, maybe a century ago, one hundred years ago, there probably would have been, if you exclude the Balkans, something like two hundred Muslims in Europe. And uh, and now, of course, it's uh, it's uh, uh, many dozens of millions, and um, and and what strikes me is that um, isn't Islam therefore Muslims practicing a religion of peace? So why this title of, of fist fights? Well, well, I think we we both certainly know that the the Muslims are uh, Islam is not a religion of peace. Uh, as far as the title of the book and the fist fights in it, um, that that comes from my experiences over over there. And um, basically, while I was traveling around Europe, uh, randomly kind of got into into several uh, fights with with Muslims. And as I talked about in the red ice interview that was really part of kind of a, a broader period of a few years where mm -hmm. I like 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 many you know young men just kind of had a, a self-destructive habit of, of getting in fights but the ones in Europe I mean they're they're a very small part of, of the journey but I guess in terms of their significance and uh, my outlook on things they were real catalysts for for how I thought about Europe and um, and myself and masculinity and that sort of thing so I I thought it was appropriate to sort of center the book and the narrative um, ar around those fights because uh, like I said they were very significant in my life but I think that um, the, the lessons or the topics that they bring up or the ideas about Europe are, are very germane to what's going on there and, and the situation uh, as it's developing. So tell me, tell me, tell me a, bit, a little bit about, about your journey because you're, you're obviously uh, much younger than I am. You are probably the, 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 the new generation. You're probably what, in your 20s? Well, I'm 30 right now. The okay. first time I went to Europe, I, I was a teenager and uh, and um, just went over to Norway, which is where all, all my ancestors are from. And, and since then, actually, both myself and my parents have gone to a couple uh, family reunions over there and that sort of thing. And that was that was extremely cool. And then also uh, traveling around Europe in in my early early to, to mid 20s as well. OK, so indeed, you, you could you could almost um, well almost be. Um... The, the, the age of, 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 of children of mine. So, so clearly, um, what's interesting is that I, I probably had a much later awakening to the to realities of, of, of Europe and the world than, than you did. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about how your generation sees what's happening in the world right now. 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. And one thing I'd point out too that whereas in the book I sort of overlay my um my my realizations or or thoughts or or you know intellectual journey of understanding with Europe is um I kind of overlay that directly with the trip. At, you know, in real life obviously I was I was a pretty young guy. I certainly didn't figure out, you know, all the things I think and know now during those trips. I mean, it was really a, a process that you know that I'm still going through. That's the whole point of, of the website and everything else is you know figuring it all out and um how each of us uh, you know as europeans or, or european americans in my case should respond um but as far as my generation i mean i i think that that as as we've kind of seen with the whole alt right or whatever you want to call it uh, i think we're at the point historically where um progressivism and the whole 1960s narrative and religion really as i call it is starting to sort of jump the shark and i think it it's naturally getting to the point now where um it, we've been so beaten over the head with all these tropes and all this you know kind of ridiculous brainwashing that there are a lot of people in their 20s right now um who who are are starting to see past it and i'm hoping we're sort of at that you know, dialectical shift to kind of borrow a word from the progressives, where uh, hopefully that that whole belief system that is so so ruined uh, Europe and America over the last fifty years is really burning itself out, and we can sort of have a, a cultural and racial rebirth into something much healthier. Mm -hmm. Now, when um, when when young people like you have this kind of um, this kind of thoughts, they are facing uh, the full weight of the establishment. The um, indeed the ideology, if if and and I think we agree that it's a sort of re a religion of uh, because it's a dogma of of all the um, the beliefs that we see all over around us and we see in the politically correct um, discourse as well as um, uh, during the, the the political campaigns. Obviously, you see all these uh, um, social justice warriors which are completely um, detached from reality, but yet put a lot of pressure on, on people, on, on their employers, and they lobby constantly everywhere so that the life of people who awaken to realities of the world are made as difficult as possible. How do you see that and how do you cope with that? Yeah, it, it's interesting, and, and I, I, I think it, it's very multi-layered. I mean, one, one great example for, for my life is, uh, I, I mean, I was certainly – a, a liberal at one point, you could say I was actually a Obama supporter in 2008, uh, and was actually was became a national delegate for him. Went to the national convention in mm -hmm. Denver, and it's so well. I mean, it, it's something I'm obviously not proud of now. It's quite horrifying, but at the time, you know, looking back on it now, the contradictions that you know that are so obviously apparent. Because I remember at at the national convention and I you know kind of I, I mean I was I certainly wasn't some dyed in the wool liberal at that point I, I I didn't care you know that Obama was black I thought all I, I was beginning to to be racially awakened already but I think that you know because I was in college I, I had still bought into the whole kind of libertarian aspect of it so much and I really liked Barack Obama and Ron Paul and I remember this is when I was 22 mm -hmm. um so I, you know, I, I was still a young man, and I ended up supporting Obama just kind of on a whim instead of Ron Paul. Um, you know, both of whom their politics, Ron Paul and Obama, are just completely antithetical to what I believe now. But I remember being at the convention, and as you know, a young Obama supporter, that was the whole narrative. You know, as the millennials supporting Obama, so I'd have these. European journalists that would, you know, that would want to interview all of us. And I remember telling them how much I, I loved, you know, Pim Fortan and Geert Wilders, because I was already becoming awakened to what was going on in Europe then. And it's just ludicrous now, this idea that I was supporting Obama while telling these journalists how much I love, you know, Pim Fortan and Geert Wilders. But, but I just think it's an example of how, uh, <laughs> how mushy it all is. And, um, and, and just how, how much this sort of you know, kind of mainstream discourse is just um, sort of accepted, but I, but I think that the that it's a good example of the fact that 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 reality is is pushing back now. I mean, you know, like you said, the the SJWs that just don't even live in in reality, and we've had this this uh, governing class in the universities and in journalism and and in government certainly since the 1960s that have really just been following this 
this complete religion that's as irrational as any other religion in, in the history of, war, of the world, if not more so. And, and now it's finally getting to the point where it, 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 it can't even coexist with reality because, because they're so far apart. And I think we you know, most forcefully see that in Europe, obviously. Yes, and um, uh, would you say that young people today, people certainly people your age or younger that you frequent or or meet, do do they do they do they care? Because obviously, you know, any religion works because it promises better future. Mm. Now, obviously, the future has been getting worse and worse for everyone, especially young people, and and definitely in, in America as well. Mm. Um, how so? Basically, the, there's reason for not trusting this religion anymore. Do you see that happening with young people? They, they, or they, or they, or they run into the um, delusion of, uh, of even further leftists and uh, and things like that. Or, or, or what do you see? That's a, a great question. I, I think that you see the whole gamut. I think that you see some people especially in the more kind of conservative red states in America that they were raised, you know, evangelical Christian and they, and, you know, bless them for doing so. I mean, they stick with it through thick and thin and, um, and they're still, I guess, I guess you would say they're still Christian or, or struggling to be Christian in the way people were maybe a couple hundred years ago. I think you see others who are, are, are sort of in the Enoch Powell, like post-Christian Christian mold. And, and I certainly, you know, I guess um, that's something I can relate or sympathize to. I don't know if I would call myself that, but um, sort of accepting the fact that, you know, as Nietzsche said, science has killed religion and, and realizing that a, a literalist interpretation of the Bible is obviously kind of kind of ludicrous, but still making that choice, you know, culturally, religiously, whatever, to identify as Christian. So I think there's a lot of, of people my age who do that. And then I, I certainly... I'd kind of say that's sort of a mirror image of of progressivism in that, uh, you know, maybe in some of these same things, some of these kind of red conservative states, I I guess it's possible to still be a progressive and feel like you're, you know, you're, you're going against the system. But really, as a whole, I think progressivism has won in America. I mean, the, the left-wing 1960s generation won. It's over. Uh, it's been that way for, for a couple decades now. So I think that um, that really the people who are more apt to question uh, the nature of things and to be, um, uh, you know, to go against the grain are the ones who are, are, um, are kind of jumping into a lot of more right-wing thinking just because it's, uh, you know, it's a pushback against, against the, the, the powers that be that are, are all progressive now. And it's fascinating to listen to people from different generations because, you know, I'll talk to, to, to one of my, my dad's friends who's in their, you know, their 70s or 80s, and they've been, a, you know, a liberal progressive all their life. Maybe they're a, a former hippie. And they still, you know, talk about uh, the nature of society like it's the 1950s and the Ku Klux Klan is out there, you know, lynching black people when, <laughs> when the reality of things is just so 100% the opposite. And now we've entered into this real, you know, period of just regressive leftism, um, as we're seeing with all this transgender nonsense. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting time. That's for sure. Yeah. On the, on the transgender thing, um, I believe that in the last weeks we've seen in the news that, um, the U S military, which used to be the strongest military in the world, maybe still is, but certainly uh, has a- accepted to 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 put into fighting units transgender trans, transgender trans people, whatever is the name for that, and um, and uh, believe me, from for now that NATO especially is very aggressive on uh, countries like Russia or China, from the Chinese or or Russian cultural point of view, knowing that there's transgender or gay soldiers on the other side, <laughs> is is extremely funny for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It is something and and actually for I believe for us as well to to imagine the kind of armies that we're going to field with this weird um, requirements for uh, cultural respect and 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 weird approaches to to that. I believe the the standards for because of women in the military, the standards for recruitment and for uh, physical fitness have been lowered on purpose so that they can manage to 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 achieve them. And and this is a this is a slope that leads to um, some absurd uh, mm-hmm. knowing the army. You know, this is a world that there is 
there is no relative thing. You either die or, or you live, and you either kill or get killed. This is not something where feelings are respected. It's it's a death game. <laughs> and, and, and when you have this absurd politics going into something so important as... Um, as this, it shows that we are at the end of something. It's yeah, soon the end. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, uh, yeah. No, uh, absolutely, and that's something I, I I wrote about in the book in, uh, in fistfights, which is the fa- the fact that now the U.S. military, and certainly I'm sure it's the same with all the the militaries in Europe, but now that it's become just another instrument of this progressive religion, that you're you're absolutely right. That means we're at the end of it. It's it's a prime example of of progressivism and and our kind of sick. Uh, you know, messed up societies just really butting heads with reality because you're absolutely right. The point of a military is to protect a nation and you need tough men who are willing to kill. You need the manor boon. And whether men are, are consciously uh, or subconsciously realizing that the military no longer gives that to them. I mean, if you're an 18-year-old man who wants brotherhood and to test himself and and the normal urge for aggression throughout all of American history, you would have found that in the military, and you would have been serving the nation or the shared honor group, etc. But whether they realize it or not, uh, I think that, that men who desire that, and I, I talked about this on the Red Ice interview mm-hmm. as well, uh, will cease to put their to invest their loyalty in uh, in in the American military in America as an ideal or or an honor group but really i mean i think that bodes well for us that's a that's a good thing i mean our interests as 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 white people i mean as as a tribe as a shared honor group are no longer being represented by our government certainly not in europe so uh, i think it's certainly preferable that that young men no longer uh invest their loyalty in the state or join uh the state's army and hopefully they join other you uh you know fourth generation warfare type organizations type brotherhoods that are in active opposition to the state so we can so hopefully uh you know the state will fall and we can um uh get things on track before it's too late mm-hmm. now to to one culture that does still have very strong inner group preference is indeed the muslim culture and um i know i know it very well for having worked in the middle east uh, quite a lot and still going in the middle east one you know my books are even translated in arabic now, can, can, to go back on your book, can you tell us a little bit about your experience, um, and maybe we'll share some, some, some thoughts on that later on, but can you tell us about your experience about these, it, first of all, traveling in, and, and living in Europe, and, and, um, and how did you get to these uh, fistfights with, with Muslims in Europe? Well, well, sure, yeah, and it was interesting. I, I, I haven't been to Europe in a few years, but I think it's even changed since the time I was there as a teenager. It, it seems so much more like things are just at another level now. And I have to admit, the idea of you know walking down the street in in one of these countries and just kind of randomly getting into a fight or a scuffle with a you know a young Muslim, it seems far uh, less apt to happen. It just seems like now everything is such on a higher level of violence and, and it's more ghettoized, et cetera. But, but I think as a teenager coming from a, a really rural, you know, tough working class town in America where fighting was very common. Um, when I went to Europe, all of the, the European, the native European teenagers who I spent time with for the most part, there were certainly exceptions, but I noticed that they were far less aggressive, far, far less apt to, um, sort of hold themselves in an aggressive manner to, to be willing to fight, etc. Whereas the, the Muslims were certainly hyper masculine. I mean, they were just as, as aggressive or masculine as any, you know, like tough, tough logging, uh, you know, sons of loggers who I grew up in, in, uh, North Idaho, um, or tougher. I mean, they were hyper, hyper violent, hyper masculine, hyper tribal, and and that's one of the things I talk about in the book is just a huge grudging respect for that and just, um, you know, recognition over time that that's that's what we need to learn from. We need to regain that for because our ancestors certainly had it. Um, but I think because of this just kind of perverse material prosperity that we've seen in the West for the last 60 years, along with this religion of progressivism, we've we've lost that. And I, I can identify with that. I mean, I certainly growing up, even though I, I grew up in an environment like that, uh, I, you know, I, I was a pretty timid kid um, growing up and uh, and it was certainly sort of a journey to 
um, to explore that, that side of my personality. Um, but I think that we're going to have to see that on, on a cultural level. We're going to have to see a major kind of shift of thinking or of zeitgeist in Europe um, and in America with, with young white men who, who have not grown up in that sort of culture or in positions where it's natural for them to, uh, to, to act in such a manner. But uh, obviously we're going to have to. And I think that's certainly possible. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's normal instinct for men to act that way. I think it's just been denatured uh, out of us um, just because of the way our culture and society has been these last few decades. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that um, you were the one trying to um, pick up the fights, right? Uh, sort of. I mean, I didn't, you know, just walk down the street attacking anyone, but I guess how I'd explain it is... Um, you know, from growing up being quite timid about fighting or afraid of fighting, I, um, by the time I got into my late teens, early twenties, I just sort of resolved that whenever a, a fight came up, I w wasn't going to puss out for lack of a better word. And I was going to, uh, uh you know, try to, try to get in the fight. And, uh, that certainly wasn't an entirely healthy mindset and it certainly got me into some pretty negative bad situations got me into some trouble but like i said i think that's that's pretty common for for young men but um but but in europe certainly being presented with a lot of you know uh, kind of similarly oriented uh you know muslim guys i think it, it was natural when you know when you're drinking at a bar or or, or even just walking down the street um that that sort of thing is going to happen mm -hmm. now one of the Usual and common thing that people who fight, uh, especially fist fights in around bars or in the evenings or for territory, is that they usually gain respect for other good fighters and other people, especially those who have um, uh, you know attitude that is um, based on honor and respect and um, uh, respect of, of of the good fighter as well. So. Usually you can you can respect your enemies uh, more than you can respect cowards and and you can respect uh, uh, people who, who shy away or run away. Now, what's what's um, how was the the relationship that you had besides the fist fights with uh, Muslims you met in Europe? I'm curious about that. Def definitely, I, I, and I, I you know I certainly I've learned way more from talking with Muslims than from you know from the the two or three fights I got in, and that's something I've always done both in Europe and in America. I, I have this compulsion, it seems, to just you know talk to every Muslim taxi driver that drives me around and just quiz the heck out of them. So I've spent a, a lot of hours of my life talking with Muslims and and just trying trying to learn about them. And um, you know I think it, it's a combination of things. I think on the one hand. And it's just sort of this normal pre-modern attitude of uh, just the way men have been throughout all of history where, uh, you know, not wanting to back down, not wanting to be taken advantage of, wanting to, to show, show that you're tough, that you're not going to let anyone push you around because that, that's how humanity has worked for all of, all of history. And then I think that and additionally, what, what uh, we see, and, and certain, I don't think most average Muslims would articulate it like this, but... Uh, maybe, but I, I think that Muslims in the West or or probably anywhere are, are kind of confronted with this super decadent kind of Westernism where it's all about, you know, women's rights and sexuality, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think they just have a real um, huge negative reflection uh to that um, as they should, where that you know that's the exact opposite of what they want, and, and I mean like the Iranian Revolution in 1979. I mean you could certainly argue that in large measure that was um, that was kind of you know pushback or bounce back against their you know the perceived creep of kind of Western decadence, and, and that they don't want that for their societies, and quite rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Now. Would you say that when um, one one thing that I found interesting with with Muslims is that um, when they conquer a place, and I have no doubt that uh, collectively they are trying to conquer the world. That's part of their religion. It's part of their credo. They do have one advantage on other cultures, which are perhaps um, uh, racially based and and perhaps want total dominance and total enslavement is that Muslims at some point offer you the choice it's, it's to join them, the choice, to, the, the, the choice to, to join them and convert and become, and become Muslim yourself. The, the Muslim you met in Europe were European converted or were immigrants? 
Um, I'd say most of them were all were all immigrants, but I'm certainly very familiar with Western Western converts to Islam, and that's also something I, I write about quite a bit in mm-hmm. in the book. Um, is is just how many young uh, Native European, Native or not Native American, but you know, white American uh, men end up converting to Islam and why they do, um, which, which we could certainly uh, get into too. I mean, I think it's just part and part and parcel of all this. We're talking about the you know Western decadence and Islam's uh, the fact that Islam represents in in some ways a, a healthier uh, way of living, um, etc. Yes, I, I'm glad you say that because I think that's one of the paradox that people who are extremely hateful of Islam always seem to fail to get, and and that you can never be, you can, certainly you cannot fight or argument against something uh, that you don't understand, and to understand um, Islam you have to rec- recognize what you just said and 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 uh, and that they are um, there are some good elements in the sense that anthropologically. Mm-hmm. What I mean, good is not good like good and evil. I mean, yeah. there are anthropological behaviors that fit what men, what masculinity, as you mentioned, um, aspires to, which mean, which is the, the honor and the being part of the tribe and being part of common shared beliefs that are that are not a pussy, that are uh, that are yeah. Uh, yeah manly, and it's about conquest, it's about war, it's about uh, uh, becoming a. a yeah, better spiritually. Even if, even mm-hmm. if we if we may disagree with the historical and the, the 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 dogma that goes with it, but certainly those anthropological points are extremely attractive for a lot of people who are lost in in today's world and people who want to who regret that Europe and and soon America and the world is getting uh, Islamized, Islamized. They cannot understand that part. And 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 I think this is a very very important element um, of Islamic culture that that makes it attractive for a lot of young young men and women because women also look for the strong man and and they look for rules and they look for the a lot of women look for a master, which they find easily in the Islamic culture. Def, definitely, I mean, I think that there that we recognize uh, their intrinsic a- attractiveness to some of these traits because they work. I mean, uh, Islam as a whole, since the the sixth or seventh century or whenever, has been immensely successful and kind of radical Salafi uh, Islam or political Islam, whatever whatever you want to call it, like Kutubism or whatever, has been by far the most successful revolutionary force for the last last half century, and that's because. Uh, as a as a cultural slash religious organism, Islam is unbelievably successful, arguably the most uh, successful force in in the history of the world, and um, it's quite quite overwhelming when you, when you think about it, uh, just just how how far they've gone and how much they've accomplished, and quite terrifying for because I mean even though obviously we we can recognize and respect these very um, tactically positive elements of Islam there's you know many other elements that are are just quite horrid and I think that um, I think those are are very apparent to to us especially in the West I mean I think Islam certainly represents um, a a non-affirmation of life or of of pleasantness I mean I think it it is I I, I do think there is I hesitate to use the word evil uh in association with it necessarily but just the the sort of obsession with whipping and cutting off hands and all the myriad tortures from the sh- from the sharia and etc i mean it, it's it's a very dark religion and um I, you know i have i have no problem saying that it's uh it's certainly uh, you know our our primary enemy and something that needs to be vanquished from from all of our lands uh, of course, and not just because it's it's the other. I mean, I think that you know, ideally, we, you know, we want Europe to be European, and we don't want uh, it to become Muslim. We also don't want it to become Indian or Chinese or Zimbabwean or and or anything else. But but even more than any of those groups, there's something very um, dark and sort of uh, anti-life about Islam that uh, is is very disturbing. Hey, but you get to. You get you get the seventy two virgins in the afterlife, <laughs> so you yeah. get to have a good life after. Now, what is true is that uh, you, what you said is very true is that um, it has been a very successful uh, religion in terms of expansion and in terms of providing people for a sense of belonging. 
However, and it's true, it has also been, uh, at least after the 13th century, um, an extremely uh, unsuccessful uh, civilization. It had these bright moments, probably because of the conquered people that were converted, that were brilliant themselves, but it has this tendency of quickly, after a few generations, um, become um, nihilistic, as you said, a sort of culture of, of death. And mm -hmm. therefore, when, when you care only about, uh, about um, non-worldly non things, quickly you, you, you do not contribute to any civilization anymore. And uh, so I, I would say there is an Islamic civilization, but usually it, it, it falls down into, into internal struggle, into warfare, and um, does not contribute to even the Ottomans, which are highly bright. You know, the Turkish people are very bright people, genetically speaking. Well, they are, they are Asians mixed with, with um, they are Mongols mixed with, with Europeans. So they are bright people. Uh, even them, after a few, a few centuries of huge successes, came into decadence and, and collapse. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, when you look at the, the Middle East, it has not contributed to the world uh, development sciences, anything for the last... It, ha it did at some point, again, mm -hmm. between the, the 10th and the 13th century. But since then, it has, only, it has not contributed anything. And, um, and, uh, and that leads me to, to the other elements, as you mentioned, Europe and the United States being um, more and more overwhelmed by people from, from, from all sorts of places, Latin America and Africa and so on. Uh, did you also meet, when you were in Europe, and I understand it was something like 10 years ago that things did you relate in your book, um, other, other cultures which had this approach to fighting and, and masculinity, like uh, cultures from Africa, for example, or, or Latin America or, or some other places? Did you, did you have interaction with other cultures like that? Uh, well, I'd certainly, I guess, a little, a little bit in Europe, and certainly, I mean, in the United States, I've had a lot of exposure to, to people from from cultures all over the world, and I certainly think the one, you know, uh, men from Islamic cultures or that Islamic culture uh, it, it represents uh, has some real uniqueness in comparison. I mean, I think that that uh, men from other cultures certainly aren't as as hyper masculine or hyper aggressive as uh, as Muslims typically are, but but it's interesting. I mean. I mean, I think that to to some extent, you just sort of see uh, the whole world becoming quite polarized now. Where on one end, there's just this sort of hyper decadent, uh, you know, progressive, liberal, um, turn the other cheek, pacifistic impulse that's really represented by you know, country not. I mean, that's I guess sort of arose in the West, but that countries like Japan, um, you know, uh, other other parts of Europe have sort of followed suit behind and then the, on the other end there's this like you said the kind of nihilistic um, hyper violent hyper aggressive Islamic impulse and I think that that really the the world or, or you know our world society is just becoming kind of polar between between those two forces to some extent and then um, yeah it, it, it's interesting I'm, I mean I see other, other than Islam I see most other cultures around the world sort of just gravitating towards or being a um, Sort of bold, bold under by this just kind of creeping progressive um, sort of corporate globalism. Um, whereas I think that the really the only the only real violent opposition to modernity or to kind of that that progressive um, the empire of nothing as Jack Donovan would call it <laughs> uh, really exists within Islam and increasingly I think within our own cultures uh, I think that like we talked about before there are a lot of uh, Native Europeans and, and Occidentals around the world who are waking up to um, to to the the. Uh, to the, the wrongness of, of the ideologies that have kind of taken over the West. And I, I think that hopefully we'll just see increasingly violent opposition within our own ranks as well to it. So one of the elements, when I, when I talk with uh, Muslim people around um, doing conferences, and certainly in Europe, but also in the Middle East, uh, I, I'm usually quite open and frank about uh, about about things. And, and I usually try to remember, to tell them that... I'm trying to tell people that we have to be cautious, not cautious is, is not the right word, but we have to be clear in understanding that our most uh, uh, 
the nearest enemy that we have as 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 white Europeans and and and, and Americans and and all that is that our main enemy is not Islam. It's not even it's not Muslims. Um, our enemy is is people from our side who have who are being who are betraying and destroying us, and and usually people from from these countries they they agree with me. Of course, I I don't talk with I don't talk with low IQ people. I, obviously, we we try to, to to have a conversation. Usually, you you get with people who are above the, the way way above the average, and they say, oh yes, these these people are. I mean, we cannot understand how stupid you Europeans are to have. <laughs> People so so silly, so power hungry that they will betray your own kind, your own culture, your own civilization, and give us money, and give us power, and allow us to invade and colonize you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, they are. You have stupid leaders. You have stupid um, uh, media and and culture and uh, and. Um, w- would you agree with that statement? That our main and most um, Death, uh, deathly enemy is 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 within our own. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I think that um, it, although, like I said, I certainly recognize some of these sinister elements. That's the right word, sinister yes. uh, within within Islam. Uh, really, the the issue between you know the West and Islam is one of proximity. Uh, I don't I don't particularly care if Saudi Arabia wants to you know uh, cut cut people's heads off for whatever reason. Yeah. I might find it wrong or distasteful, or, or wants to whip women a hundred times for having choice. the veil fall off. But it's the fact that. That our our elites, uh, the progressives, have decided to import them by the tens of millions into Europe, and and that gets to a lot of the stuff I'm starting to to write about and focus on more now, which is the real strategic side of it. And um and as I talked about on the the on the Red Ice podcast that we were referencing, mm. um I I think that that really the situation as as it as it sits in Europe today is one of uh, all the governments being led by by the progressive elites and then really obviously the Muslims being being a fourth generation force and what I mean by that is a a shared honor group that's in opposition to the nation state I mean obviously the Muslims aren't investing any of their loyalty in the, the nation state whatsoever they're investing it within their own community and that puts them in opposition to the state but really us as 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 Europeans, as white people that that want Europe to survive, that don't want um, either A, to become enslaved to, to Muslims, or B, just to become one denatured, deculturized, deracinated, um, coffee color, or mix at the end of the day, we are also then by definition a a fourth generation force in that we are equally opposed to the governments that currently uh, rule uh, Western European nations, if not all of the the Occidental West. So really then it just becomes a question of if if the governments of Europe uh, and the rest of the West are not serving our our, our people's needs and in fact are in complete opposition to our people and causing massive harm to us, uh, then what do we, both individually and collectively, uh, what are we obligated to do vis-a-vis those governments? Yeah, and what, what's in, what struck me is, as, as you are, an, of course, an American, um, you write, you're, you choose as for the, the, the title of your blog, European Civil War. And and what what make first of all what makes you think that we're going to have a European civil war, or or what makes you not think that you're not also going to have an American civil war, and um, and tell us a little bit about how you, how you came to this blog and and what you usually write about on it. Sure, absolutely. So so obviously, I mean, I think that um, that that all of us recognize that Europe will eventually descend into ethnic conflict. Um, I think it, it's already starting to happen now, as the as the percentage of Muslims within all of the various European nations continues to expand. Um, they're going to continue to to seek more and more power, and it, things are going to continue to deteriorate, as you're very familiar with, obviously. And um, a, as the infrastructure starts to collapse as as the 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 fourth generation force that is islam um seeks to or becomes i mean they're already a parallel force to the government but they'll just start to basically replace the government um i think that obviously there will be increasing violence i mean by civil war i'm, I'm certainly not talking about it in the like klaus witzian 20th century mm-hmm 
sense. It's not going to be, you know, nation states A, B, and C against nation states E and F. Just civil war as in ethnic violence, complete breakdown, as we saw in Lebanon, in Afghanistan in the 1980s and 90s, in Bosnia, in Chechnya, etc. It's, it's just fourth generation warfare, basically, between uh, non-state entities and the nation state and between non-state entities and other non-state entities. Um, as far as why my focus is, is so fixated on Europe, I think that I think that Europe represents, a, 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 I guess you could say, sort of a clear distillation of of our people, uh, our cultures, um, against a, an alien force, like one single alien force that is that is in opposition to them or increasingly at war with them. And by that, I mean I mean the the Muslims. I mean basically, the threat in Europe is pretty is is one group. It's Muslims, obviously. The you know the the primary or the threat that we have to focus on first is the is the basically traitorous or suicidal European governments, but it, it's a clear struggle I guess between um, you know our people versus one single other. America, by contrast, is, is very interesting in that uh, you know I don't I don't really see any sort of looming uh, conflict that that says. Um, where the lines are as clear. I think America, what we're more likely to see, I think America will, will actually continue, uh, all things being equal, to, to do okay economically. Um, I, I think that what we'll see is just an increasing loss of trust between populations, which is, has been written about certainly as diversity increases, um, etc. Uh, I, I don't know. America is just its a, a tough nut to crack. I mean, certainly immigration in America is just continuing. Um, but the fact that we have so many different immigrant groups – it, it just lends it a much different a much different character where I think everybody just becomes more atomized and you know you have one Korean family or, or a few that are surrounded by all these Arab families but over there there's black people and, and it's just it's much closer to anarchy than it is to any easily defined um, easily defined conflict if that makes sense mm -hmm. yes so what you describe and, and I think you and I we share um uh, a fondness for military strategy and military um, uh, studies. Um, so maybe a lot of our readers don't don't necessarily understand what fourth generation warfare, or even sometimes I like to call it fifth generation warfare. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, because I think we're getting into something even newer and even different. Because you you, you took the very right example of Lebanon and 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 uh, and Chechnya and Yugoslavia. Lebanon civil war started in 1975, and it's in a way it's still going on, and therefore um, it starts to you know these new wars, especially when when um, nation states are weaker than before. I mean, look at the militaries of Europe; have never ever been that weak since since all since the fall of the Roman Empire, and um, and um, and therefore these civil wars may take, I don't know what's your, and tell me your opinion on that, um, mm. but they may look like, no, there's not like two sides, it will be many sides fighting, to, you know, uh, black Africans don't like uh, Arab Muslims, uh, and, mm. and Arab Muslims Muslim hate and enslave usually black Africans, uh, and which, which themselves don't really like with each other, whether they're from West African countries or even different uh, ethnicities within that group and so on and so on. So it may look like there's going to be some sort of everyone against everyone. And, and even within Muslims, there's huge, mm -hmm. uh, huge, as you know, differences and, oh, yes. and, and fighting. And at the same time, it may last forever because there's no nation states, at least not that I can uh, foresee, that will support any one group more than another. And, 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 as, and we may w come down for um, some war that will last Generations, if not centuries, uh, certainly in Europe. So I, I want to have your, your opinion on that. You, you write about these kind of possibilities. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So to, to start, I guess, to jump back to America real quick, I think that's the other big distinction is that even though in America we have a lot of immigration and things are certainly a real mess in a myriad of ways, the American government is still, uh, you know, abundantly strong in relation to any group within society. I mean, the the idea of any 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 you know fourth generation shared honor group within America being a threat by itself to the government, it, you know, it just it just isn't the case. On, on a on a fourth generation level, the American government still has pretty much as much legitimacy as it ever had. It doesn't have as much trust. But I don't think I don't think many people in America worry that it's you know the police are going to start stop um, patrolling the streets tomorrow. Whereas in Europe, the situation is quite the opposite because uh, things are moving in that direction very quickly, and that's one thing we you know I focus on a lot on the website mm -hmm. on EuropeanCivilWar.com is just sort of tracking the statements by these various police chiefs in the different countries who are they're trying to raise alarm bells and say hey things are falling apart we're not able to to maintain order anymore. And obviously, you know, their governments aren't, aren't really doing anything. They're just making it worse by allowing in, you know, more and more Muslims. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that in Europe, um, it, it's going to be quite the opposite of the wars of the 20th centuries and that it, it will have, I think the, the violence, the ethnic conflict will have very little to do with nation states. And, and really, it, it bears more resemblance than anything else just to some kind of perverse experiment. Uh, I mean, really, if you had dreamt it up of uh, uh, in a lab, it, it couldn't have been any, any more awful. I mean, it's really just this question of what happens when you bring, you know, tens of millions of people from all over over the world who often don't speak the same languages to to an area and uh, where they overwhelm the government's infrastructure what happens next and uh, I think that obviously then it, it returns to the law of the jungle which uh, is uh, you know as Thomas Hobbes or whoever said uh, you know uh, nasty brutish and short mm -hmm. and I think that yeah. Europe is going to go through a period of just untold horrors and I think like you said it will last for a, a very long time um, as far as, as as the nation state's role in it, uh, I, the way I might, and like I said, I certainly don't have any expertise on this more than any other random person, just a, a real interest in it. But I think that to, to try to get an idea of how things might play out, we really have to look at, at the various nation states of Europe and what kind of course they're on. So certainly some like Sweden and probably Germany are just on course for complete anarchy uh, and destabilization and falling apart. But I think there are others, like certainly Hungary is a prime example, mm -hmm. um, who are really taking concrete measures to to maintain a strong shared honor group, to, to not uh, allow immigration. So I think that as things deteriorate, there will be nations like Hungary that are able to play a, de a decisive role in it, and, and certainly a positive role vis-a-vis -vis our side, uh, whereas there are other nations that might be uh, very influential now, like say Germany or Britain, who are on course for just real, real uh, total destabilization, where the nation state as such will have very, very little influence on the course of events. You're right to to mention these differences, or and for example, paradoxically, um, Southern Europe or European countries like Italy or Spain or Portugal or Greece which are in deep economic troubles, but also don't have much social programs because they, can, they can't afford them, they never could, um, have a lot of migrants that go through but don't stay. Yes. And, um, and therefore, they, they don't have the same problems that indeed Germany, of, of, course, of course Sweden is a basket case, but, uh, but even, <laughs> of course, uh, France or, 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 in, or, or UK have. And therefore... Um, may survive um, a little, relatively better, in, in a way. Um, the, the interest of mine in, in what you say is that, obviously, as you know, I write about how you survive such things. Mm -hmm. And um, what I found very much, very interesting in some of your views was that you were mentioning the... Um, well, first of all, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how, what you think about how we are going to, or how we should uh, prepare ourselves for that. But also, what you mentioned that I found extremely uh, brilliant and, and, and quite original is to say that maybe we should also we should organize ourselves the way secret societies such as the Freemasons or the uh, 
uh, other, uh, let's say, cults or religion, some, some religions do organize themselves in networks and things like that, to, to enable to have um, basically resistance uh, network, or at least at, at the very minimal survival networks um, that are set up. And I, I wanted to have your, your, your approach or your, your thoughts on, on this survival approach to, to this mess that is coming, this civil war that is coming. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, honestly, you, you can already see the very beginnings of, of some of this stuff now. There was an article I read, I think it was on Breitbart today here in the U.S., and it was it was talking about um, right-wing activists in Europe having to hide from their governments, because obviously there's many cases now of, uh, of governments in Europe that are imprisoning people for... Um, for saying things online, uh, you know, that are, are very much like what I say online or, or certainly like what we see on sites like, you know, the Daily Stormer, for instance, um, but that the, the laws or the governments are are so oppressive and so scared now in Europe that they're arresting European bloggers for, for saying those same type of things. Um, it makes me it makes me grateful to live in America in that regard, uh, I'll admit, um, at least, uh, you know, as, as far as that mm -hmm. goes. Anyway, but it, it was talking about how they're already seeing these cases where there's people in Europe who are, are writing things online that's then getting sent to a server based in other countries around the world so that this stuff can appear online uh, and so the authors can, can get it online without being arrested basically. So I think that already is a real illustration of sort of this – the you know, the first stirrings of, of coordinated resistance. Um, as far as – as 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 the other stuff you brought up, I think a lot of that stems from uh, a, a very intelligent commenter on my website bring up this idea of uh, C four ISR structures mm -hmm. and um, and basically that that that's not it's not any any it that's not about any structure at any specific time in in history. That's just uh, basically a a way a, a word that would describe structures that have. The potential for 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 basic you know command logistics where you're able to pass information to all the members you're able to uh, you know there's a, a system of rankings etc. It could be any kind of organization that has a a functioning bureaucracy basically, and uh, that that's sort of an example of, of an area where the, of something we're sort of without in Europe today uh, and in America certainly. I mean really. The the average person. I mean, I'm not I'm not a member of any organization that that's anything like that. Uh, and I think that's one positive step all of us can make. And it almost doesn't matter what the organization is, but any sort of infrastructure we can be a part of is, is positive. And I think the reason that that none of us really belong to organizations like that is just this very uh, atomized, ins you know, insular nature nature of uh, of modernity in which it is so hyper individualistic. Um, it certainly wasn't the way our societies were for our grandparents or great grandparents. So in that regard, I think anything we can do to become part of of organizations is a positive, whether that's something that uh, is uh, explicitly or implicitly related to our, our beliefs and philosophies, or whether it's something uh, completely separate. I think uh, one, one example of a, of a type of organization in Europe uh, or in America is just a gun club. I mean, there's gun clubs, shooting clubs all over Europe, and I think that as things increasingly fall apart, that'll be a very natural uh, sort of, uh, of locus point uh, it, from which people will coordinate. But I think it's just building those bonds, whether they're totally beneath the surface and secret, like a secret society, or whether it's just, uh, you know, uh, coordinating with your neighbors, uh, anything like that is a positive. A very good, uh, I don't know, you're probably aware of that book, a very good and short book is, um, is, is one called The Starfish and the Spider. I don't know if you've read it. I actually, I know, I know you mentioned that via email, but I, I'm not familiar with okay. it. But basically, it's uh, it's um because I'm I'm studying uh, guerrilla warfare and uh, counterinsurgency and insurgency, and uh, and this is a very good book to start for, for if any of the readers want to learn a little bit more about how you organize. The the, the subtitle of the book is the unstoppable power of leaderless organizations, and it says basically why the title is that. You you have to set up organizations that spread like um, and connect like uh, like spider webs, but at the same time they have to be like starfishes. If one piece is cut or or, or destroyed, it can regrow, and uh, because there's no leader, because there's no hierarchy, 
And in fact, most of the successful uh, guerrillas movements, whether they were in Cuba or uh, um, in, uh, in Algeria, interestingly, or, or, uh, or around the world, when they are successful, or, or indeed Al-Qaeda or all these, these, mm-hmm. these guys around the Muslim countries, is there, you know, when you kill the leader, there's another one and so on and so on. Like, 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 and there's no disorganization because there's a, a sort of software that is common to all of them and anyone can restart and also they don't have the uh, strong um, hierarchy which uh, if you cut the leader or you cut the head, suddenly there is a chaos and, in, and it's a long reorganization. There's no organization, therefore you can never, you can never destroy the, the, the organization. You have to fight it in a completely different way, which is what counterinsurgency and I study a lot of the Israelis and the British, which were uh, really very, very, very efficient in that, and they still are. But indeed, the, um, the, the organization of people who want to survive in a chaotic world has to be extremely flexible on one side, and at the same time, uh, extremely reliable on a um, network of people which, on very simple, common, basic um, features, for example race <laughs> just very simple is that you, you cannot hide you know if i go to the black panthers i cannot say <laughs> well look bro i'm i'm with you they know i'm not with you i'm with them i'm i'm white i cannot be a black panther uh and 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 likewise if i go to muslims and i cannot pretend to be a muslim unless i know the rituals and the uh, arabic and i know uh, the quran and i can recite it i mean there's very easy ways to find out who's with who and um and, uh, and again, I'm not saying my enemies are, are these people, uh, but certainly when governments will, will and are starting to hunt down anyone who's resisting, even, even in thought, like the Soviets used to do under Stalin, uh, well, um, we have to think really hard in, with, with other ways to at least organize ourselves to, to cope with the laws, with, to cope with um, Communication and 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 the examples uh, the example you gave is is is, is very very um, pertinent. Yeah, I, I think it's it, it, it's very fascinating, and I think it's easy to get discouraged um, in that. I mean, things things are just moving so fast in Europe with with uh, the level of immigration, you know, the the massive number of rapes, everything like that. So I think that, you know, one thing that, that you notice online sometimes is just this discouragement of, you know, look how horrible things are going and look how ill-prepared we are, look how little people are doing about it, etc. But I actually really think that's misguided. I mean, I certainly understand it because things are bad, but I think that if you really look at it, I mean, you know, Western Occidentals in Europe but all over haven't really – needed to to defend ourselves or to organize in, in a in a self defense capacity for so long that it's quite natural that it's it's not just happening instantly and and um really even even if you compare it to to islamism you know this sort of a broader force we're, we're, we're sort of opposed to now or, or existentially threatened by. I mean, obviously, Islam as a religion or even Wahhabism have been around for hundreds of years. But really, when we look at groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, really, you can trace them pretty much back to Sayyid Qutb and, a lot, and his writings, which were back even just in the 60s or 70s. Yes, that's and, true. and just like just like how how this phenomenon today where you know there's these giant global terror networks sprang from the you know what was a, a completely incoherent you know uh, philosophy that existed in uh, tangible form even 50 years ago i think that's very similar with our side today i mean i think that you know i think we we have all these great writers and, and real geniuses in our movement or whatever you want to call it and i think you know we're at the point now that everybody recognizes what the problem is and we all understand the problem of this you know suicidal death religion of progressivism we all understand that we are very immediately threatened on an existential level in Europe by Islam and now I think is where you know we start to see writings emerge and discussions of okay what do we do about it and and I think we're already seeing that happen um, and, and certainly that's a that's a, a dialogue I'm obviously trying to be a part of or something I'm trying to to figure out uh, as are countless other people and I think that uh, as we as we keep seeing these 
these attempts at resistance, like the murder of Joe Cox or uh, the the private killings, which I think you know yeah. the private killings were were very horrible things. I mean, I don't think it's it's congruent with our honor codes to to kill women and children. But anyway, what what I'm trying to say is that that as we start to see manifestations of resistance. It's starting to catalyze real discussions about, okay, what do we as people who, who want to commit our lives to preserving Europe, uh, what do we do about, about what's going on? What is right? What is morally justifiable, etc.? And while that can seem uh, you know, very inchoate, like I said, that's no different than, than it was for other revolutionary movements at that same point in their development. And, and, and certainly we need the secret handshake. <laughs> so, Absolutely. <laughs> so, so look, um, I think this, um, this is, these are very, very important points. I, uh, I encourage our listeners to, to check out your, your blog, europeancivilwar.com. That's yeah. That. And um, I will definitely order the, 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 and, and read um, your book uh, as soon as I'll, I'll, I'll get it. And uh, this is a conversation that needs to be continued because these are elements that are fundamental in building up, uh, let's not use uh, big words like the resistance, but certainly, uh, or the rebellion, but certainly <laughs> we, need, uh, we, need to, we, we need to know that um, the history is on our side. Definitely, we, we, we have been at a low point and we are probably at the lowest point of uh, European civilization, uh, at least for a maybe 15 centuries, since the fall of the Roman Empire have not been so low, uh, despite the, the appar appearances. But um, from here, we can only go up again, because uh, it's a question of survival. And usually people, uh, they find the courage uh, and uh, the, the energy of despair that makes them um, um, survive. I, I, I tell my Muslim friends, by the way, that last time... Um, the Western Europeans have been pissed off. Um, they reconquered Spain and they didn't stop in Spain. They stopped in Peru. And last time, Eastern, well, uh, Central Europeans were pissed off at the gates of Vienna. They ended up in 1918 conquering the Ottoman Empire and uh, Jerusalem and creating Israel a few years back. So you don't want to piss Europeans <laughs> because when, when we get really pissed, we, we, we put the full weight of our aggressiveness and our intelligence, two things that go together, and we develop the technology that, you know, a few hundred million people with the right technology are no match, uh, are, 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 you know, facing a few billions of people with no technology or not the same technology and it's a in and it's a, it's not the same category. We we can we can win, and and the, and and it's not my goal to you know I want my countries and my lands and my people um, to live um, fairly and happily and uh, and like real real men and women. I don't want to do harm to other people elsewhere in the world. But I know that history usually is a pendulum that today we're at one side of the of the of the spectrum, and when it will go the other side. I can tell you, maybe we'll have 200 years of civil war in Europe, but then the next 200 years, I don't, I, I really will pity the people who are around the world that will face us because I know who we are. We will, we will rampage again, and and it's inevitable. <laughs> it's just the way it is. What my concern is, of course, the next generation or two. So, um, we've been talking for an hour. It's it's really great. I I thank you very much for your time. Uh, would you like to tell something to 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 close to to our listeners? And we'll do it again. We'll do another another talk uh, later on. Uh, no, no, I I appreciate the discussion. It's been great. Um, yeah, I guess I just encourage them to uh, come to the website and and comment if they can. It's uh, we're we're just starting to to publish uh, submissions from other folks. So if they if they want to write anything, that that'd be fantastic too. And uh, but uh, it's pretty much just me trying to trying to figure this out as an individual. And um, uh, you know, I think that's all. That's what all of us are are doing. I mean, we're seeing these these very fluid developments in in Europe and America, and then it just becomes a, a question of of how we each respond on an individual level and and hopefully a, a collective one uh, later on actually by the way we are uh, on uh, actually my time we're on july 6 uh, it's early in the morning it's uh, just past midnight 
Today is the end of Ramadan for, for Muslims, and it's the, um, the biggest holiday, the biggest uh, celebration that they have, the Eid. And um, if, you know, there will be a lot of Muslims listening to us. Um, do you have any message for them? <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't know. I certainly, uh, I, I don't know what I would say. Uh, uh, my thoughts on Muslims, like, like we talked about earlier, I have a massive amount of respect for them and I'm immensely saddened that, um, that we've ended up in a situation in the West in which, uh, the el elites, um, in, in which a, a philosophy has arisen, which, like I said, I certainly bought into while I was growing up, um, that that has led to multiculturalism and uh, led to this sort of awful situation uh, we see ourselves in now. And um, yeah, I think, like I said, all of us are just figuring out as individuals uh, how to how to think about it and um, how to respond. But uh, you know, obviously, things things are not looking good. Well. Will uh, it? It will. Uh, it can only get better then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, Julian. Um, so once again, people can uh, check out your work and your book at europeancivilwar.com, and um, we'll speak again later in the year as soon as I've I've read your book, and um, we'll continue the discussion. Thanks a that lot. Sounds great, Pierre.